recording in process. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful prayer. I uh, once again I welcome everyone to this special gospel event. May I at this point respectfully invite the speaker for the event today, our brother Ross Mitchell, to speak to us. Welcome, brother Mitchell. Well, thanks. Um, thanks. Um, I, I think. I think in Navy Oak, you're, I, I hear feedback. Maybe I'm hearing through your um, microphone or something. I'm hearing you loud and clear from me. I don't know about others. Yes, I'm uh, hearing you. What I'm saying is I think you need to mute your mic, um, in Navy Oak. I need to do what? Mute your mic, I think. Your mic, I think. Okay, let me try something. Let me try something. I can hear you. I, I, I hear the feedback. I hear myself talking like a second after I talk. <laughs> oh. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I just try just try to mute it on the Zoom app. You should see the mute uh, at the top on the Zoom app. And then when you're ready to speak, just unmute it. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. What, what he's saying is mute the uh, Zoom app. And then when you're ready to speak, unmute. Okay, I'm not hearing the feedback anymore. Oh, can you mute me? Yeah, we can hear. Okay, I, I'll tell you what. I'll just get started, and we'll take it from there. How about that? <laughs> Go for it. Okay, let me let me let, let me let everyone then you can unmute yourself and begin to speak to us. All right. Well, one uh, one thing I wanted to say is I greeted a bunch of my. You muted your mic, brother Russ. Somebody muted me. I don't know. I didn't hit it. <laughs> I need the old did because he wanted to mute everyone out so that uh, you wouldn't get the feedback. So you're, okay. you're good. Okay. So I'm good now. Thanks, Terry. That's one thing I wanted to say, too, is uh, my, my, the oldest, my oldest friend, Terry Baysmore, is on the, uh, the call, and I really appreciate, Terry, you being here. Um, we met, I think he's either in third grade or fifth grade, and uh, we've, we've kept in touch over the years, and... Uh, I'd say Terry's more like a brother than a than a friend. So thanks for being here, Terry. My pleasure, and it was third. Yeah. So um, also, if any of my students, I'm not gonna be able to see all your names. So if you if you're here, please send me a message and just let me know that you came. Uh, I did see a couple, but anyway, I just that's a quick announcement and then before I get started I want to give credit where credit is due um, I'm not a Bible scholar and I haven't gone and looked at the uh, manuscripts and studied these I've read but I do like to read and I, I have a, a special interest in apologetics but I want to give a man named Vadi Bakum um, especially uh, extensive credit because uh, he I saw a video of his, and it's uh, explain. It's one of the best explanations of the Bible um, as a reliable document. And um, I've extensively copied things that he has said, and so I want to clearly say that some of the things I say are Vadi Bakum's. Um, I've also read uh, "Evidence That Demands a Verdict" by Josh McDowell, "How We Got the Bible" by Neil Lightfoot, and "Letters from a Skeptic" by a guy named Boyd. And then recently I finished a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nibal Qureshi. All these are really good references, and all of these have influenced what I'm saying today. Um, and I've also chosen, it's not usually my way to read a manuscript, but since there's a lot of technical, like a lot of details and technical things that I might not remember, I went ahead and wrote it. So I'm going to be reading. It's going to be a little different than what I'm used to, but we'll... Um, 
I think it'll be okay. So let's get started. Um, well, actually, before we get started, consider this. God reaches requires faith in him. There's a measure of the unknown in faith, but faith does not remove the facts. My faith is based in the facts, and I love facts. I'm an engineer. I've studied science and engineering. I love to observe the natural world and see God's glory in it. It works perfectly and is self-propagating, self-sustaining. If God is the creator, then all the facts point to him. So let's look at some of the facts about the Bible, our authority as followers of Jesus Christ. Why the Bible? Why do I choose to believe the Bible? Why the Bible over other books? You know, as any of you said earlier, all world religions have their book. Everybody ascribes authority to their book. So that question, that is a question we need to answer. It is a question people are right to ask. A non-Christian is right to ask a Christian this question. This is a critical point. It's the crux of the matter. Why the Bible above other books? Everyone, everything you discuss with a Christian person will hinge upon that question. Why the Bible? So here's the statement that I'm going to repeat parts of and all of it and many times because you learn through repetition. I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies, and they claim that their writings are divine rather than from human origins. Um, and I also uh, display this at the end of the uh, my, what, I, what I have to say so you can see it, maybe write it down or take a screenshot or something. So that's it. I'll say it again. I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in the fulfillment of specific prophecies, and they claim that their writings are divine rather than from human origins. Now, some people might say you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. Well, my goal here is not to prove the Bible or defend the Bible. My goal here is to show you why I choose to believe the Bible. Some of you may live where there are lions. A man named Charles Spurgeon once said, I would no longer defend the Bible than a lion. You don't defend a lion. You just let him loose. He'll defend himself. The answer to the question, why do I believe in the Bible, resides in the Bible. Why would I appeal to the Bible in this way? Because there is no higher authority than the Bible. If I appealed to another authority, then I would be conceding that there was a higher authority than the Bible. I claim that the Bible is the highest authority. Therefore, I... By definition, I cannot appeal to another. So let's look at what the Apostle Peter has to say. So if you have your Bible, turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. So 2 Peter chapter 1, I'll start with verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the, on the sacred mountain. We also have a prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in, our, in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So here it is, step by step, because every point is important. First, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. The Bible is different from other holy books. It is a collection. We don't just have one individual where he says, I heard from God and everyone must listen to me. The Bible is a collection. 
This collection of people tells a consistent story, even with all the diversity. The Bible was written on three different continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. The Bible was written in three different languages, mainly Hebrew and Greek. Of course, Hebrew is the Old Testament, Greek is the New Testament, and there is a little Aramaic mixed in there. Um, the Bible was written by over 40 authors with multiple walks of life. There are kings and generals, fishermen, tax collectors, doctors, historians, priests, shepherds, and others. We have people from a variety of backgrounds, careers, educations, and talent. These authors give us 66 volumes. These 66 volumes cover hundreds of various subjects. They were written over a period of, of more than 1,500 years. This is a collection of reliable historical documents. It is not just one individual making a claim. This is incredibly important. We often don't think of the Bible in this way. Sometimes we think of it as just this one book that we have. But all of this, all the information that I just mentioned came together to give us the Bible. So it's a collective, its collective nature actually adds to the reliability of the Bible. This collection of people tells a consistent story even with all the diversity. This is like having multiple witnesses of some event, let's say maybe a parade. So maybe you have a person on the second floor looking out a window, second floor of a building. One person may be in a car, another person may be standing on the sidewalk. They all can describe what they see because, and, des and describe the parade before, and describe the parade from different perspectives. But they are all talking about the same thing, the parade. This reinforces the validity of the evidence. It's corroboration. Corroboration is where witnesses tell the same story. So before we go further, I do want to explain something. The statement says written by eyewitnesses. Not all the writers were eyewitnesses and not all the things recorded were seen by eyewitness by human eyes. But understand what I'm trying to say. Most are eyewitnesses. The rest is well documented. Genesis chapter one is an example of where we don't have eyewitnesses. People were not even created until the day six. Another example, here's another example. Listen to this from Luke chapter one. Luke is a doctor, he's a physician and a historian and a companion of the apostle Paul. So here's what Luke chapter one, one through four says. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fill, fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Here's what is interesting. Luke was not an eyewitness. Luke doesn't claim to be an eyewitness. He's an historian who claims to have traced the information from the eyewitnesses. This adds to the idea that we have a reliable collection of historical documents. Luke shows that we have a reliable collection of historical documents through his gathering of witness evidence that confirms the other three gospels. And two of those were written by eyewitness testimony, Matthew and John. Here's another interesting point. I'll mention this again. Some of Luke's eyewitnesses were women. Women were not considered credible during the time that Luke lived in Jewish history and culture. So using a woman as a witness would have hurt Luke's position when he wrote it. But he included it because that's what happened. Some people ask, why do we need four Gospels? Because all these stories are telling the same story from a different perspective. The fact that Luke was not an eyewitness, but collected information from people that were eyewitnesses and that, they, that he followed the details closely also confirms the other sources. He openly says he is not an eyewitness, but that he has collected the information from eyewitnesses and that he has followed everything closely for some time past and that he wanted to write it in an orderly account. Here's another reason we need four gospels. Their different goals. Luke's goal is history and chronology. 
Luke's goal is I want to give you things as they happened in order. John's goal is evangelism. He tells us this. I write these things so you will know that Jesus is the Christ. So his goal is evangelism. John orders his gospel around seven major signs. Mark's gospel is the shortest of the gospels and his about brevity. Um, he tells the same story, but really quickly. It is brief with just the facts. Matthew was written to a Jewish audience. And he wants to show that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Matthew's gospel emphasizes things important to the Jewish people. He starts with a genealogy and shows fulfillment of prophecy. Now notice what Peter says, uh, going back to the scripture we are reading. These are not cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in power. What he reports are not myths or fabrications, but the fact of what happened. Notice the next phrase, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Here's the second point. The Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. Please look at 1 John 1, 1 through 4. Notice John's choice of words. We've seen, we've heard, we've touched. So here's John, 1 John 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. These weren't people who later on had a vision. These were people who were eyewitnesses to the events. We are not just talking about the New Testament either, but also much of the Old Testament. We're talking about eyewitnesses to events who wrote about the, those events that they saw themselves. So, I, so we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. It is good to have a reliable collection of historical documents. It is better to have a collection of written by eyewitnesses. They're also written during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. So I keep repeating myself on purpose because hopefully this is the part you'll remember. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. There are people that want to argue with that. They want to date the Bible later than that, but there is a huge problem with it. Problem there. That's corroboration. The Bible corroborates itself. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 1. This is Paul writing here. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he uh, appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. If you, if you do the math, there are at least 514 witnesses to the resurrection that were alive at the time 1 Corinthians was written. So we have hundreds of witnesses of the resurrection that were still alive. They were still alive when 1 Corinthians was written. Now, just hold on to that for a second. There's one thing I would like to mention. It mentions the 12. Some people object to that because Judas killed himself, which left 11. 
But Matthias was chosen to replace Judas in Acts chapter one. And the requirement was he had he would have had he would have been an eyewitness to everything from the beginning. That's in Acts 117. So there are still 12, even though Judas killed himself. Um, but during our pause, let's consider archaeology. There have been more than 25,000 archaeological digs related to direct related directly to the subject matter of the Bible. None of them has contradicted information in the Bible. The overwhelming majority have confirmed and affirmed the content of the Bible. Archaeology has never found anything to contradict the Bible. Here's an example of science, not necessarily ar not archaeology, but oceanography. A guy named Matthew Fontaine Maori discovered the ocean currents because he had read Psalm 8.8, which speaks of the paths of the sea. He reasoned that if God said there are paths in the sea, then it was true. And this caused him to search them out, and he found and, and defined how the currents in the oceans flow. Let's get back to 1 Corinthians 15. We have 514 witnesses to the resurrection recorded in 1 Corinthians. Why is that important? This means the gospel message, the message of the Bible, is falsifiable. This is important. When we test the veracity of a claim, if someone is if someone is making a claim and the claim cannot be falsified, that means you cannot test the claim. A claim that cannot be falsified is not a very strong claim. That means I simply have to trust you. There's nothing I can do to falsify your claim. You just have to trust me. The claim is the claim of resurrection is falsifiable. When Paul wrote it, it was falsifiable claim. And yet it was never falsified. 514 witnesses in 1 Corinthians is a piece of evidence that must be weighed. And we're related to, and probably is a very similar falsifiable bit of information is the empty tomb. If a first century Jew fabricated a story about the resurrection of Jesus, would he choose women to be the first to discover this? Remember, women were not considered reliable witnesses. Now, you may not know the story, but women went at daybreak to the tomb and found it empty. And they came back and reported that to the apostles. So I think if someone was going to fabricate that, they probably would have picked Peter or John or one of the 12 or someone closer to Jesus to, to discover the tomb, not a group of women, like I said. In the first century Jewish culture, women weren't even allowed to give witness to, in court. Because so, this, so the fact that he used women, or not that he used women, but women are, are recorded as the ones finding the empty tomb, uh, gives, would have hurt the story with his contemporaries. It's in the story because that's the way it happened. Consider what you would do if someone, if, if some follower of Jesus came to you and started talking about the risen Jesus. I'm talking about if you were in the first century, standing there in Jerusalem. You know, if it was me, I would say, just stop talking. Let's go find Joseph of Arimathea. He can take us to his tomb, and we can go look at the body. But that never happened. Even the enemies of Jesus declared the tomb was empty. The question from the first day was this. How did it become empty? The empty tomb was actually validated, not falsified. And of course, there's been a debate ever since. But there is a problem. Some, some people believe the New Testament, including 1 Corinthians, was written later. Some say that there was Constantine, and he put stories and made up information together. Then he said, get rid of the other stories and information. He kind of made his own uh, story up. I'm claiming the Bible was written early. I'm claiming that the New Testament was written early. The New Testament was complete, completed by the end of the first century. So here's the first objection. The Bible is not, re is not reliable because it has been translated so many times. Um, they say it is like a game where one, whis one person whispers a phrase in someone else's ear. This is repeated many times. And the end result is usually vastly different from the original statement. The problem with this objection is that the translators go back to the best and oldest documents every time. 
They do not use the most recent translations. So when the Bible is translated, the translators review the oldest documents, not the most recent ones. If you look at the time, to, if you took the time to learn ancient Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, you could test the translations against these ancient documents. These translations can be tested. There is software that you can use to test these translation against doc, the documents they are translating. There is no hiding here. In fact, we are more capable today than we've ever been in translating the Bible. And I have something I was going to read, but I'm not sure I'll have time. So I'll just put that off for now. It, it addresses the variants. And um, so if, if there's time, I'll, I'll go back and read that. So here's another objection. All we have are late documents, recent documents. And we don't know what were in those early documents. Let's consider the manuscripts themselves because there are some issues we need to talk about here. When it comes to the Bible, it is true. We don't have the originals because the materials these were written on. To simplify, let's just consider only the New Testament. We don't have any original documents, but we do have documents that date back as early as 120 AD. These are fragments, not whole written documents, but they are fragments of the book of John. That's within a couple of decades of the completion of the New Testament. We can go back and put our hands on documents that go back to within a couple of decades of the completion of the New Testament. How many manuscripts do we have? We have uh, over 5,800 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts in, of the Greek New Testament. Now, I'm not sure exactly of that, that word, of, uh, that number, 5,800. I think there's, it's around 6,000. Um, the references I looked at were, were a little different, but um, there's a bunch of them, about 6,000. So we have over 5,800 Greek documents, and some go back to within a couple of decades of the last writings. We have 20,000 documents of Greek and other languages the New Testament was translated into, and this also may include some of the early church fathers' writings. If that doesn't sound impressive, consider other ancient, doc ancient writings, ancient documents. For example, if we were talking about Aristotle's Poetics, we have less than a dozen of these documents, and the earliest one is a thousand years after the originals were written. Consider Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars. Again, less than a dozen, and it is oh, the, the closest one to the original is over a thousand years from the last writing of the existing documents. The best in terms of numbers is Homer's Iliad. We have over, well, we have a few hundred of Il Homer's Iliad. But the earliest manuscript is written 2,100 years after the original. But people question the New Testament. If the Bible is not considered rely a reliable document, then there is not any ancient document that can be considered reliable and trustworthy because none comes even close to the Bible. Here's another objection. There is overzealous monk, the overzealous monk theory. Constantine and his monks change the story to suit their purposes. If these people were going to change the original story, there are three levels of conspiracy. The first one, the monks would have to find thousands of Greek manuscripts and partial manuscripts, consistently change all of them while not damaging them, not showing their ink work, and using the same handwriting styles. They have to get them back to where they stole them from without getting caught even once. And then not ever tell anyone what they did. But you, uh, you may remember that Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all people. The early Christians took this very seriously. So very early, the Bible was translated into several different languages like Syriac, Syriac Coptic, uh, Latin, um, other, other languages too. So in addition to secretly altering the thousands of Greek copies, they would have to find and retrieve all the copies in different languages and do the same thing. Change all these documents in different languages, making sure their lies were correct and consistent in for various foreign languages, not show their ink work, get them all back where they stole them from, and not tell anyone what they did. The third level of conspiracy, uh, the early, early church fathers 
quote the New Testament extensively. Some people estimate that 95% of the New Testament could be reproduced from their writings. So now these overzealous monks would have to not only change thousands of Greek manuscripts and the early translations in various languages, but also all the writings of the early church fathers as well. This would include the quoted scriptures and their commentary. So in summary, these monks would have to find thousands of Greek manuscripts, partial manuscripts, steal them, change them, don't show their ink work, and put them all back without anyone getting caught even once. Then they would have to find all the Syriac, Coptic, Latin, etc. translations, change those to match the lies they told in thousands of Greek manuscripts, get these back where they stole them from. Next, get all the writings of the early church fathers, change those to match the lies they told in the Greek manuscripts and in the Syriac, Latin, and Coptic, etc. translations. Never tell anyone about it and never get caught doing any of this. So, this is not very likely. In fact, it's pretty much impossible. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. So far, we just have a good history book. Now it gets good. Consider 2 Peter 1.17. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So we have a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, and they report supernatural events. We're not talking about superhuman events, but supernatural events. They're talking about the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus was transfigured. He was visited by Moses and Elijah. The Bible is not just a bunch of rules about religion. The Bible includes a collection of, of natural of reports, a collection of natural, supernatural events. These men claim that Jesus healed the sick. These men claim that Jesus walked on water. And the best example, on Friday he was dead, Sunday he was risen. These are not just the writings of a religious community trying to pass down their rules and regulations. We do have those. But these individuals are saying that there are supernatural things that happened. When Moses crossed the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was drowned, these are supernatural. These are, these are the types of things we have in the Bible. Not only are there, they supernatural events, but they are supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. We're not talking about a general Nostradamus prophecy. We're not talking about a vague general prophecy. In the right, in the right size group, you, I could say, someone in this room is suffering from a back condition, or there is someone in this room that recently lost their job, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what the prophecies I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the prophecies found in Isaiah 53, for example. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah, over 700 years before Jesus was born, prophesied that Jesus would be born and that he would be a suffering servant. Isaiah 53 is a powerful passage, but maybe it is not old enough for you. It is a powerful passage. There's a group called One for Israel. They do outreach to Jews in Israel. One of the things they do is the Isaiah 53 project. They will lead, they will read Isaiah 53 and they will ask their Jewish friends and counterparts to tell them who it is about and where it's from. In the Jewish reading calendar, they skip Isaiah 53. The Jewish people in their religious practice, when they're reading Isaiah, do not read Isaiah 53. They go 52, 54, they skip it. So when Isaiah 53 project reads Isaiah 53, the Jewish person will say, that is about Jesus and it's in the New Testament. When they show that they have read it from the Hebrew Bible, then they show that they've read it from the Hebrew Bible. That's Isaiah 53. In one specific case, the man became angry because he knows what that meant. The Jewish religious leaders had been lying to him and that the life and de death of Jesus is, was in fulfillment of specific prophecy. This is not the oldest prophecy. Isaiah is 700 years before Christ. What about a thousand years? 
Let's go to Psalm 22. Now, if I wanted you to turn to Psalm 22 in the first century, I wouldn't be able to, to tell you to turn, turn to Psalm 22. We've only had chapter and verses for several hundred years. I would announce the first line of Psalm 22 in Aramaic, which is Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? This is what Jesus says while he is on the cross. So Jesus states the title of a song while he's on the cross. So here's an example. If I say, pass me not, O gentle savior, savior, at least for you Americans, what's the next thing that comes to mind? Hear my humble cry, right? If I say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Next, that saved a wretch like me. That's, that's just here in this room or this conference. What if I was about to be executed and I said the first line of a song and then you watched me die? You would probably think about the rest of that song. So let's consider Psalm 22. Starting with the first verse there. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthr enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. If you are in, if in, your, in you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and they and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now let's pause for a comment. That is exactly what was the, the mocking people said to Jesus while he was on the cross. Verse 9. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan, encircle me. Roaring lions that tear my prey, that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Here's a comment. Why? Because he's nailed to a cross. My heart was turned to wax, and it was melted. It has melted within me. That's interesting because after he dies, they thrust the spear into him and pierce the pericardium and blood and water flows out. Verse 15, my mouth is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. Another thing, what's, what's one thing Jesus said on the cross? I thirst. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. So dogs is a reference to Gentiles. And guess what Roman soldiers are? Gentiles. A pack of villains encircle me. Jesus was crucified between two criminals. They pierced my hands and feet. Not everyone that was crucified was nailed to a cross. Some were just tied and it took days to die. Verse 17, all my bones are on display. So here's a comment. They broke, they broke bones to hasten death. Jesus was crucified just before a high holy day and he needed to die quickly so, they, so that his body was not hanging on the cross during the Passover. But they didn't have to break his bones because he was already dead when they came to him. So none of his bones were broken when he was crucified. Verse 18, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So here's a comment. That was written a thousand years before Jesus was born. And it was written by a man who never saw crucifixion. How do, how do we know that? Because crucifixion was not yet invented. And also, the, uh, they cast lots for Jesus' clothes. That's verse 18. There are several more verses. We'll just stop there for now. But I think you can see that Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus was even born, is, is a specific prophecy about him. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. 
They report supernatural events that took place in specific fulfillment of specific prophecies. Peter goes on in verse 20. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Finally, they claim they wrote from divine rather than human origins. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecy and claim their writings are divine rather than from human origins. They claim this is from God. Many times you hear, thus saith the Lord, the Lord said, and the Lord spoke to Moses, and thus saith the Lord, all throughout the Bible, this is God's word, not men's words. They're claiming these are God's words. When these prophecies are fulfilled, it becomes credible. It gives credence to that. Does it not? This is God who is speaking. Oftentimes, there is an individual that can't, just can't get there, can't go there. Men wrote that. Then you can't believe pretty much anything written in a book because men wrote them all, right? I can't believe because men wrote that, yet men wrote all books. So I, I appeal to them, people like that to consider the evidence that's just been presented. There's one more thing that I'd really like to mention that I've heard several times, and that's the scientific method. People say, well, I'm a man of science. I need to prove things scientifically. To use the scientific method, something must be observable, measurable, and repeatable. You don't use the scientific method to prove historical events. You use the evidentiary method like you would in a courtroom. So what do you do? You ask about reliable sources. You ask about corroboration of sources. You ask about the internal and external evidence that supports these sources. These are the kind of questions you ask. Who are the witnesses? Are they reliable and trustworthy witnesses? Is this falsifiable? Are there other things that, that are con contradicting this? Are there other things that are confirming this? These are the kind of questions you ask in the evidentiary method. And when you ask these questions, they come, oh, you, they come away with things like three continents, three languages, 40 authors, most of which never met each other, they wrote 66 volumes. These volumes address hundreds of different subjects and topics, and they come together in a cohesive unit that tells one redemptive story. And it is written over 1,500 years. Therefore, you have corroboration. You have reliability. You have 25,000 archaeological digs that relate directly to matters discussed in the Bible that have confirmed what we, have, we find therein. You have the writings of contemporaries that confirm what we find herein. An intelligent man can say, I choose to believe the Bible. The facts support this position because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in the specific, pro uh, the fulfillment of specific prophecy and claim their writings are divine rather than from human origins. So that's, uh, that's what I had to say. <laughs> I would like to share that phrase. Let's see. How do I do that? Nefioke and I did that the other day. Okay. Right. Okay, there it is. I had to minimize to, uh, here it is. All right, so can you guys see my screen? So if you want to, that's the statement I kept repeating. <laughs> and I did that on purpose. Hopefully that wasn't uh, annoying. I did it because I was trying to help you remember. So here's, uh, you can take like a screenshot of this if you want to. Um, and also there'll be a, recording um and i really don't mind to send the document i was reading to anybody that wants to see it um 
So, and oh, I did want to share one more thing. I mentioned a couple of books. I put them in my PowerPoint. What's going on here? It's not going down. There it goes. So these are two of the books. Josh McDowell, Evidence that Demands a Verdict. It's on the left. And that one is a really good summary of pretty much all the evidence about Christian faith. It's in kind of an outline form, so it's not an easy to read book, but it, it gives you incredible uh, information in pretty much the whole thing. Um, the one on the right, how we how I got how we got the Bible by Neil Lightfoot. That's more of a technical book. It talks about paper and stone and ink and papyrus and a lot of other things. But I'm just emphasizing it talks more about the technical aspects of the physical Bible, not the words in it. Um, and then these two books, I just finished reading Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And that is an incredible story. It's extremely well written, and, and it's like you won't be able to put it down once you start. It's, it's Nabil telling his story. He's, he's a devout Muslim, raised in a, in a wonderful family of devout Muslims. And um, he's a, he was in the debate. He's got a, he's a uh, one of those people that debates, and um, he encountered some loving Christians that were well equipped, and they were able to look at the do the evidence like we did today, but in much more detail. And he was convinced and became a Christian. It also, if you're if you deal with, if you're working with Muslim people, uh, it, it tells you kind of the catch point between Islam and Christianity which are, I, I really am very ignorant of Islam, but I'm learning. And uh, the one on the right is called Letters from a Skeptic. And you can see a son wrestles with his father's questions about Christianity. This is another really good book that covers many topics. It does have some about the Bible itself. What happens there is Edward Boyd, Boyd is the father, and he's he was raised a Catholic man. And he was pretty much done with religion. He was He felt it was abusive and he didn't believe in God or he wasn't sure what to think. And his son had become a Christian and was a, was a professor in a college somewhere in Minnesota. And you can imagine they, they would get together and they would literally yell at each other and it wouldn't be good. And they didn't like that. They didn't want that to happen. So the son, Gregory Boyd, wrote a letter to his father and he said, look, when we get together, we're always arguing. So why don't we do this in writing? Why don't you write me a letter that says your your objection about Jesus, God, the Bible, religion in general, whatever. Just write any question you of your objection, and I'll return a letter explaining my point of view. So over the year, this took several years, but eventually the father did turn to Christ. Um, this is I'm not talking about the uh, like the Church of Christ, um, but anyway, what I'm trying to say is it's an excellent book. It covers all the hard subjects. Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, those kind of questions. And so if you're interested in in learning more about that, that's a really good book. And it, it, it's a kind of old book, so you can get it for like 3 or $4 off the Internet. And there's several other good ones, but these are the ones that I really have used and enjoyed and learned from. So there's that statement again. But it's like 3 o'clock. I did pretty good. I stopped at 3, <laughs> almost 3. <laughs> so... So, Nephioch, I'll stop right there. I did have something else I could read, but um, that'll take another few minutes. So, Nephioch, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, but brother. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. Okay, please, can you up your screen? I've taken a screenshot oh, yeah. of this uh, text. Yeah, that should have done it right there. Oh, thank you so much. 